Good morning, everybody. It is good to be here uh, with you this morning, and I'm, I'm thankful for the visitors that are here this morning uh, as well. Um, and uh, just uh, thankful to be here, to be able to bring you God's word and, and preach to you. And um, I, I love uh, this building is just about full. Uh, we can still bring some more people in here, though. Um, so I, I'm thankful for, for all of you that are here this morning. Um, we have been studying in Genesis. So if you want to be turning to Genesis chapter 4, that's where we're going to begin this morning. But we're trying to understand Genesis. Genesis you know, literally means the beginning. Um, that's the first few words there in chapter 1 of Genesis chapter 1. It says, in the beginning. Uh, that is the word Genesis. And so we're going back to Genesis because we want to try to understand a little bit more about our origin, but also understand about our identity, about who we are. And Genesis helps us to understand our identity. And as we've been looking at, we've been looking at uh, the first chapter of Genesis, talking about creation. We've also looked at uh, the creation of a man and woman, and also looked at the fall when Adam and Eve sinned in chapter 3. And so we looked at, in that moment, what was lost, what happened that was lost when they participated and partook of the fruit, the, the fruit of the tree of good and knowledge, uh, their trust in God. They were hiding from God, trust in each other. They were clothing themselves. No longer could they be uh, with one another naked. The presence of God, they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. They could not be in the presence of God. We see in Genesis uh, chapter 3 the idea where God is coming through and, he, and he's seemingly walking here and looking for Adam and Eve. And where are you? And so there's, there's a connection and intimacy which they had there uh, before that sin took place. And then their abundance. We talked about how God told them they can have any fruit and any, anything of any of the trees that I have provided for you. In other words, God provided them with an abundance. And Satan came in and said, ah, yeah, but look what you don't have. And, and that's how Satan continues to work in our lives today. It, we, we, we forget what we do have, and we're looking at what we don't have. It, it's not something that is new to us today. It's happened all the way back there in the Garden of Eden. And then also, but what was found? What was found is equally important about that time after they ate of the fruit. There was a seeking God. God came and said, where are you? God wants to know where you're at. He's asking, where are you? He is a God of hope. Just knowing that there is a God seeking us should give us hope, should give us something to look forward to. He is a God of provision. Even though they were not able to have the abundance there of the Garden of Eden because they were kicked out, God still provided the tools necessary for him to cultivate the land then himself. But he had to work by the sweat of his brow. He's a God of grace. They deserve death. God, God could have struck them and, and taken them out in that moment, but he was a God of grace, and then thus, because of that, a God of mercy. This is all review, so for those of you that say, wow, you're going through this really quick, these were lessons from before. I'm just kind of bringing us up to speed. And so then we looked at, a couple of weeks ago, what wasn't lost, because this is important to the entirety of, of the series that we've been looking at. The image of God was not lost. The image of God was not lost. And this makes a huge difference in how we view one another. That's why God, in Romans chapter 5, it was interesting that Derek uh, used that verse this morning, that talks about, it says, while we were yet enemies of God, God sent his son. God sent his son. Because in the beginning there in Adam... Adam was made, Adam and Eve were made in the likeness of God. God said, let us make man, or humanity is the word there, in our image. In chapter 5, that is brought back to our attention. That's after the uh, fall, after they, Adam and Eve had sinned. In chapter 5, they're talking about how Adam and Eve had another son, Seth. And in those first few verses, the idea of the image of God being passed from God to Adam, and then Adam to Seth. That's important for us to understand and realize that even though there was sin there in chapter 3, our identities or the image of God was not destroyed. It is not destroyed. 
Also in Genesis chapter 9, 4 through 6, God makes a command. It says, if any of you, if any man or man or woman murders someone else, a fellow human, murders with, with anger, with intent, not a, uh, a, an accidental killing, but a murder, then that person is going to be guilty of murder and his own life will be taken. Why? Because he murdered someone who was made in the image of God. These are important for us to understand because in Genesis chapter 3, some people will say or will purport that the image of God was lost. But why bring these up in Genesis chapter 5 and Genesis chapter 9 if it was? I contend to you that it's not lost, that it is still part of us. And while we may not view it, and I told you last time in Genesis chapter 3 that after Adam and Eve partook of the fruit and they sinned, they viewed one another through the eyes of sin. And I told us we need to be careful with how we view one another and how we view ourselves because oftentimes we are viewing this world and ourselves through the eyes of sin. And we talk down about ourselves and we look and talk down about others. That is sin talking. That is not God talking. God is coming after those who are sinners, who are enemies, who are justified. So what I want us to view with in light of this is one more verse here to consider. This is a verse we often go to. Romans chapter 1, 18 through 20 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in righteousness because that which is known, the truth, which the previous suppress, about God is evident within them. What is that, Paul? Paul being the writer to the letter to the Romans here. It says, For God made it evident to them, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. How have they been clearly seen? Being understood through what has been made. Creation, that which God from the beginning of the world created. And so we look out at the created world and we see the evidence of a creator. Why? Because we see design. We see function. We see thing, how things work together. But I want us to bring something else to consider in our minds this morning in context with my lesson. When we think about this, this verse here, we often think about creation meaning out amongst in, in the nature, right? We think about trees, we think about mountains, we think about water, we think about the animals. What was also created? Yeah, you and I. To them, for since the creation of the world, what was created there, the creation of the world? We were. Have you ever looked at a human being and went, there's a designer. You might have looked at a human being going, what were they thinking? <laughs> we look at people and go, oh my goodness, they're horrible. I can't be around that person. I can't stand that person. What are we viewing those people through? I want us to think about that in our minds. When we are dealing with people, right? The old adage, if it wasn't for the people, the church would be perfect, right? Well, the church is the people. That's part of who we are, okay? But we, we need to understand, I think that we need to take this verse a little further and include the rest of creation, which is us. We often will look at our children when they are born Yo, oh, wow, we have a creator. Look at, look at how this works. Look at how this functions. Look how everything just, and, and we look at our, our, our young children and go, wow, that is so great. And then when they get older, we start accusing them of being the, the child of the other parent. Your son, your daughter. Hey, what happened to the we thing, right? We start losing the perspective that God wants us to have. And I know we do that in jest. But we lose the perspective that God wants us to have. So we're looking at Genesis chapter 4, and I want us to kind of keep that in mind as we continue our study here in, in, in Genesis. This is all, all connecting 
And we're going to ask, ask the question here, what continues? We looked at what was lost, we looked at what was found, we looked at what wasn't lost, but now I want to see what, 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 what after this. So in Genesis chapter 4, Genesis chapter 4, we now have the account of Adam and Eve's first children. Okay, and it says, Now the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived, gave birth to Cain, and she said, I have gotten a man child, or I have, have, have had a young man, a boy. With the help of the Lord, again, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. And Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Verse 3, so it came about in the course of time that Cain brought, Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground, because he is a tiller of the ground. Okay? Abel, on his part, because he is a keeper of flocks, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain became very angry, and his countenance fell. So <clears throat> what's happening here is we have, some, we have a little bit of insight into more of Abel's offering than we do of Cain's. Abel's offering says the first part of his firstlings and also the fat portions. The, fir the, the, the firstlings are the firstborn, the very firstborn. These are going to be uh, ones that are uh, prized by anybody, right? But because they are prized the most by us, that is what Abel then offers to God. The Hebrew letter in the New Testament tells us his offering was made with faith. We only get from Cain that there was some sort of his fruit of the ground, but it doesn't indicate that it was first fruits. It might have been some other fruit that came after that he took his own fruit first. And so now we see kind of the inside of the heart here that God favored or looked well upon that which Abel gave and not which Cain gave. So Cain got angry. Okay. Cain got angry. And so what happens here is what is continuing here in this world is sin that it, sin is continuing. Look at verse uh, 7. If you do well, will not your countenance, that is your face, be lifted up? And if you do not well, do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you master it. We see here that sin continues to be the problem. Okay? We have choice. God has given us choice to choose, just as he gave Adam and Eve choice to choose not to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge and good and evil. He's also giving here Cain a choice. Why are you angry? You know, if you, just, if you do well, your face, your, your manner, in other words, when he's talking about you know, his face, it's very obvious. You ever, you, know, you ever walk into a room and you see someone's face and it's very obvious that they're upset? Husbands, you ever walk into a room and your wife and you're like, oh, turn around and walk right back out? Her account, she's obviously upset. Children, you ever walked in and see your dad and your mom and you know they are upset? And you're like, it's probably my fault. It's very obvious. Here with Cain, it's very obvious his face is showing anger, frustration. And this, this word for anger is, is deep anger. Okay? This isn't a passing anger. This is an anger that has taken hold of him physically. It has been in his heart and in his mind, and it's manifested itself outwardly. We have all had anger that we can hide. This is an anger that Cain cannot hide. While God knows the inside of the heart, he has seen the anger in his face. And so he comes to him first. And I want us to recall also the same idea that when after Adam and Eve had sinned, God came to them and said, where are you? God comes to Cain and says, why are you angry? If you don't change, if you don't walk away from this anger, sin is crouching at your door and you are going to sin. This reminds me of a verse that we find in the New Testament that God says, whenever you, and I'm paraphrasing it in, in 1 Corinthians, whenever you are faced with sin, God promises that he will give you a way out of it. 
a way to not sin. There is an exit. There is a way out. In other words, we are never going to be in a situation where we are forced to sin or to not sin. God gives us a choice. He has given Cain a possibility, an opportunity to not go forward with what he knows he's thinking. Brethren, we have that opportunity too when we are faced with temptation. Imagine, imagine now that God is, is speaking to you when you are faced with temptation and, 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 and he's saying to you, you don't have to do this. You don't have to do this. There's, there's a way out. There's a way out. You need to be master over the sin, not sin master over you. But sin is the problem. Sin is the problem which we face today as well. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, Paul is talking to uh, the church at Rome, and it's comprised of both Gentiles, those that people would be considered at that time outside of the Jewish nation, Jews and Gentiles. And he's basically telling them, yeah, you guys think you're better than one another, but you both have fall, fallen short of the glory of God and sin. In other words, we're all, you're all in the same bucket. You know, Californians look at Texans and go, what are you thinking? Texans look over at Californians and go, what are you thinking? Right? And Colorado's guy, get out of my state. <laughs> right? But guess what? No matter our choices, we all find ourselves in the same boat. We all fall short of the glory of God. Sin is our problem. Sin is our problem. We have sinned. And so that is the problem. So that is what continues here with Cain, but also what continues, or what also, excuse me, I got ahead of myself in the next point, and what happens as a result of this sin, as we've seen in Genesis chapter 3, and also we're going to see in Genesis chapter 4, is separation from God. Adam and Eve were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, all right? So then, uh, look over down here, At verse chapter 4, uh, verse 12 <clears throat> and following, we see here, When you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. You will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is too great to bear. Behold, you have driven me this day from the face of the ground, and from your face I will be hidden, and I will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth." and whoever finds me will kill me. <clears throat> because of his sin, which we'll go back and look at in just a second, Cain kills his brother Abel. Now, because of that, he is going to be driven from this place in which he was tilling the ground. Remember, this is the ground in which uh, his dad, his father, Adam, was also tilling. Cain learned what his father did. He was tilling the ground now. And, got, and now he's going to be driven out into a land where there's not going to be, it's not going to be as easy as it was with his father Adam. Which like, Adam's working by the sweat of his brow. Now it's going to be even more difficult. Sin can make your life more difficult. You ever wish you not have made a choice that you did and it was a sinful choice and it made your life more difficult? Remember how we talked about how sin can, can make God become a threat rather than a comfort. That people around us can become threats rather than people that we should go and talk and be with. Adam and Eve became threats to one another. They put on clothing. The intimacy was lost. We can become threats. And so now Cain is being driven out. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, uh, you can just write that down in your notes, but we're not going to go there for the sake of time, tells us that God says, he says to Israel, says, my arm is not so short that I cannot reach you, talking to Israel, and my ear is not so dull that I can't hear you, but it is your sin that has separated you from me. We see that origin and understanding in principle in Genesis. We see that in Genesis 3, and we see that in Genesis 4. 
Sin is the problem. It separates us from God. But remember, we are still made in the image of God. We are still, even though we may not understand it, we are still His children. But as we've talked about in Romans chapter 1, there are many who are suppressing that truth. What's that truth? That there is a creator. There is something greater than what I see in this world, out in what we might call creation, but also in one another. The next thing, though, that I want us to point out is what has continued. It is a God who is seeking. Okay, go back up to verse 8 in chapter 4. Cain told Abel, his brother, we don't know exactly what he told him. We're not given any more evidence or any other information other than that. We don't know if Cain said, hey, Abel, let's go out in the field. I want to talk to you a little bit, or I want to show you something. We don't know exactly what happened here, but we know that Cain talked to his brother Abel, and, and he says, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. The anger in which God warned him about, he did not receive that admonishment. He did not receive that and, and take into question what he was thinking. The anger overtook him, and he decided, no, the only way that I can do is, is to reconcile this with myself is to kill my brother. So then look at verse 9. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? When I read this, this brought me right back to when God came to Adam and Eve and said, where are you? Where are you? It's the same word here. Where, where are you is actually one word in the Hebrew when he's talking about at, to Adam and Eve. It's one word. Where are you? Here he uses that similar word and says, where is Abel your brother? Now remember, we talked about this with Adam and Eve. This wasn't a question of, of uncertainty on God's part. This is a question of opportunity. You kids, you ever been asked something by your parents and you know that they know, but you still lie? You know, you know, oh yeah, I'll have to talk to your parents about it. They're shaking their heads up here. You know they know, but you still say, I don't know. Right? That's got to, that's, that's, that's the representative of just the ignorance of us as kids. We always say, I don't know. That never works, does it? Does it ever work? It never worked for me. My dad say, oh, so you're saying no. No, that's not what I'm saying. Okay, don't say I don't know. Come up with something better, like the truth. Right? I don't know. God knows. God knows what happened here with, with Abel. Okay, so he says, <clears throat> um, in... in uh, Verse eight, Cain told, sorry, verse nine to you. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he said, look what he says. I don't know. I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? He's trying, he's trying to distance himself and, and, and justify. I don't know where my brother, am I my brother's keeper? You know, Adam and Eve. Where are you? We're hiding. Well, who told you you were hiding? Well, why are you hiding? We're naked. Who told you you were naked? Well, you guys ate of the fruit. Well, Adam goes, God, it's your fault. You gave me this woman. The woman says, it's not my fault. It's the serpent's fault. Cain says, I don't know. I'm not my brother's keeper. You see, justification of ourselves continues on as well with sin. Because when sin happens, the truth also leaves. And that's part of what God wants. Don't we see that in these questions? This is the God of grace. This is the God of hope. This is a God that's extending mercy and he says, what happened? Tell me what happened. I want to know. This is a God who seeks the lost. 
This is a God who seeks the lost yet here today. In Romans chapter 5, as was going over, while we were yet sinners, while we were yet enemies, and he talked about that whole length, while we were yet unjustified, God sent his son. Why? Because he is a seeker of the lost. He knows everything we've done. And believe me, I've sat across from people when I've studied the Bible and say, James, you have no idea what I've done. And I said, you're right, I don't know, but I do know that God knows. And God is still extending this opportunity to you because he is a seeker of the lost. He knows you've sinned. He knows you might be in a difficult place. He knows you might have guilt. But he also knows that you were created in his image. And he wants you to come back to him. I wonder in, in taking this all in then, if we know that God is a seeker of the lost, we know that Jesus says in Luke, I believe it's 19, uh, around uh, verse 9, 10, or 11, Jesus says, I came to seek what? And save the lost. He came with the purpose to seek and save the lost. That started in Genesis. And it's always been God's mission to seek and save the lost. And I wonder if our evangelistic efforts would be different if we viewed each other in the same way that God viewed us. Is that even a question? That's why I brought up Romans chapter 1. That if we viewed humanity, that we viewed our co-workers, we viewed that person that cut us off, we viewed that person who was rude to us, we viewed everybody with the eyes that God has, that that is someone who's been made in the eyes of God or made in the image of God, how we would view them evangelistically. That we might consider what is actually important is not my pride, not my feelings, not how I feel about that person, but what is most important to that person is that as they understand that God is their father and he wants them to come home. And this is what the church says. I, ain't, I am not telling you anything that God hasn't any said. This is amen to God's truth. And I had a quote back up here that I want to go back to that I want to look at here. So bear with me. Here it is. We must decide, look at this, you must decide whether or not you will design your life after, life after the pattern of Jesus or design your life around the best thinking the world has to offer. I might also put in there your thinking. This is a decision that we daily, daily need to make. Am I going to try to pattern my life and my decisions and my perspective on the way Jesus has his life? Or am I going to do it on what the world has to offer me? What my friends may have to offer me that would be counter? Or the culture? Or even myself? What are we going to decide? And so then after we realize what continues, sin is the problem. Separation from God is also the problem because of sin, the result. But we also have a God who seeks the lost. Then how are we going to respond to that? How do we respond this morning? Are you someone who is in Christ, but you're struggling with sin? Are you struggling with the people that you work with? Are you struggling with some, some people at school, your friends, with family members, maybe with your spouse? Maybe it's time we need reminding of whose image they've been made in. Because it's not mine, it's God's. Don't we always sometimes, don't we wish sometimes, that doesn't make sense, always sometimes? This is the Jamesism found in 2 James. Look it up, you can find it there. Don't we sometimes view people and go, I, I wish they would just do things the way I did? Why, don't, why didn't they just do this? Why, why couldn't they just do this? It's because whether we realize it or not, 
The people that were surrounded weren't made in our image. And I'm thankful for that. You know, you give me some hair and I kind of look like my son Rylan. You give me a mustache without the hair and I look like my dad. But I'm still completely different from both of them. And that's on purpose. That was God's intention. So instead of looking at them and complaining about them and what they're doing or not doing, start viewing them as God looks at them. And then look at yourselves as God looks at you. How will you respond to that? And then for those of you who are visiting here this morning, and maybe you're understanding, you're realizing that you are in sin, and that maybe you are separated from God, or maybe you're not sure, God gives us Christ as the gift of grace for us to be saved from our sins. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter is preaching to the Jews that are lost. Why are they lost in the context there? They are guilty of the murder of Jesus. They are guilty of the murder of Jesus. I don't know that you can get any more heinous than that. But guess what? That sin was also forgiven. They said, Peter, what do we do? He says, each of you repent, be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, and you'll be saved. You'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The sin problem there is taken care of because God is reaching out with Christ. He is seeking you this morning. He's saying, here is my son. Believe in him. Be immersed, and you will be saved, and you will once be not an estranged child of mine, but you will be my child, and I will be your father. Please think on these things this morning, however this might apply to you, how you might respond. This front row is left here for those that might want to come forward as we, start, as we sing a song uh, here. If you'd like to come forward and, and, and ask for prayers, um, or if you're ready to be immersed into Christ, that is also uh, available for you this morning. But let us stand and sing the invitation.